Welcome to Freedom. Am I hot here? Glad to see you today. And uh, thank you for that worship set, Tony. It's good, good stuff. If we've got kids in the room, do we have any sixth grade or under? I do not think that we do. We'll just all stay in place then for the day. Now I am on. I am never completely sure how to read a morning like this morning because uh, sometimes when things feel flat, it's just because it's the weather or we stayed up too late or whatever, and sometimes there's a spiritual component to that, so it's hard to know for sure what's going on. But there is a heaviness in the room this morning, and we want to make sure that we don't uh, allow anything from the enemy to interfere with what God wants to do because there's significant stuff that's supposed to happen here today. So I'm going to invite you to join me. As I know we just prayed. We're just going to pause for a moment again and just uh, make sure that we are operating in a, in a cleared sanctuary so that there's nothing present but us and the Spirit of the Lord to be able to do His work. And we're going to invite uh, again for Him just to speak to us in a fresh way. So I'm going to invite you. Would you join me again in prayer? And as we just bow again in the presence of the Lord, we just declare, Jesus, you are Lord. You are King over all creation. You're King of the universe, and you are Lord over our lives. And so with one voice, we declare that. Church, I'm going to ask you to voice that aloud in prayer. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is King, and we submit to his authority. Lord Jesus, this is the truth, and we yield to you, and we invite you to reign in every part of our lives. And as we yield to you now, we stand against everything that the kingdom of darkness would marshal against us, our lives, our families, and Freedom Church. And in the name of Jesus, we bind those spirits and command that you must be silent, you must leave us, and leave this place and go now to where Jesus commands you to go, but you are not allowed to return. You can only go in one direction, out and not in. And we declare the victory of Jesus at the cross of Calvary and at the empty tomb, and we plead the blood of Jesus over all who are gathered here today and over all who are watching and listening online. And we invite now the filling of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of Christ, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome in our lives we need you, we long for you, and we ask you now to come and fill us and to speak in a fresh way to us. I'm going to just invite you, church, would you just ask the Lord right now to speak in your life, to do a fresh work in you today? Would you just tell him you don't want today to just be another religious ritual, but you want a fresh encounter with God? Voice of the Almighty, speak in a fresh way to us today. We welcome your voice, we welcome your work. And we pray this with expectant hearts in the matchless, wonderful name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Well, again, welcome to Freedom. To those of you who are joining us online, we're so glad to have you tuned in and uh, being a part of a service like that. We're beginning a new series today. It's an important series. I am so glad that you're here and able to, to dial in from the very outset. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and be turning with me to Mark chapter 5. We're going to be in Mark 5 and 6 today. I think you would probably agree with me without having to give it a whole lot of thought that uh, certainly the last year has been a reminder of just what a crazy world that we live in and that the, the direction of things overall, at least in the part of the world that we live in, is sort of disturbing. That it seems like that just people and the culture as a whole have gotten just sort of crazy and out of control and that it seems to make less and less sense that you just at times want to ask who is in charge I mean who allowed it to become as crazy as it is I, I heard a silly story this week that I thought was a great illustration of just how silly crazy and out of control things can be and it's told as a true story I take it as such it, it uh, happened in Charlotte North Carolina an attorney of all things had uh, bought himself a very expensive set of cigars. Maybe you, you've heard about this story, but uh, it's a very expensive set of cigars. He was somebody who loved to smoke a good stogie, and it was valuable enough that he actually took out an insurance policy on his cigars and found an insurance company that would insure his cigars. <clears throat> they wrote the policy, and in the first month after he got the policy written, he smoked all 24 of the cigars in the box. And then, as only a good lawyer would do, he actually filed a claim 
reporting all of his cigars as having been destroyed in what he wrote up as a series of small fires. F seriously filed a claim, and of course the insurance company, as they're processing this, said, well, this is completely frivolous. This is silly. We're not going to pay. And so he did what a lawyer would do. He sued the insurance company. It actually went to court in Charlotte. As they had to go before a judge, both sides presented their case, and the insurance company said, this, the Judge, this is just silly. This is frivolous. He smoked them, and he's saying that they were destroyed in a series of fires. The judge, when it came time for the ruling, he, he agreed, at least in principle, with the insurance company and said, This is completely frivolous. You're, you're right. It's absurd <clears throat> that he's brought this case. However, you wrote an insurance policy that insured him against all kinds of loss, including damage by fire, and technically fire destroyed all 24 of his cigars, so you're going to have to pay. Rather than taking the time and money of appealing this, the insurance company ponied up a check for $15,000 and wrote to the attorney for the destruction of his 24 cigars that he had smoked, and they gave him the check for fifteen grand. But that isn't the end of the story. The lawyer, when he deposited the check, was shortly thereafter arrested because the insurance company brought charges against him for arson, having destroyed his own property by fire. <laughs> and that was the conclusion of the matter. We live in a crazy world where occasionally there is justice. <laughs> On a grander scale, it is hard to overlook the ways in which our culture seems to be increasingly shallow. If you notice just the, the depth of relationships and things that have real meaning for people, it just seems to be a more shallow culture. It's a, it's a more crude place that we're getting to. And so many things just reflect how distrustful we've become. I mean, we're just a, a culture that's filled with conspiracy theories and distrust for people. And sadly, I don't know that there's any place where within our culture, within American culture, where we see more distrust than what people have for the institution of the church and for Christians. I mean, have you observed what terrible skepticism there is today by the world concerning the church and Christians? And I'm afraid that the reason that they feel that way is because they've looked at the church and they feel like we don't see anything any better or any different among Christian friends and among church people. And so we, we live in a time <clears throat> when there's just a, a desperate need for us as individuals and collectively as a church to reemerge as the beacons of help, hope, healing, transformation that we were intended to be. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that? That, that the world truly is at a place of, of need that another program isn't going to fix what's broken. And, and the reason that the world, I'm afraid, is looking at the church, at least in America, and saying, why would we want to go there? I mean, you realize we have a whole generation that's coming along behind us that's shrugging its shoulders and saying, why would we want to take the time to be a part of that? Why would we want to go on Sunday morning? If we could take a little tour and just ride around the eastern shore and visit a bunch of churches this morning, can I tell you what you won't find? You won't find dozens of churches with lots of millennials in them, and that's no attack on millennials. The younger generation has looked and said, we don't see anything there that's of great value to us because programs are not enough to change the world. Programs are not meeting the deepest needs that people have. We are at a place where there is a desperate need for something fundamental to change. And I would suggest to you that for us individually and as the church that we're going to have to take a step back to reevaluate some things, and we're going to have to make some very clear intentional choices. Over the course of, of the next eight weeks, we're going to talk about eight different decisions that we make, decisions that really do define us. And some of them are decisions, decisions that we're making again and again and again without even realizing that we've made the decision that we've made, that we're going to have to step up and get a fresh perspective on things so that we can choose a different course and be a different people. I want to begin today by reading together a pair of stories that are recorded by Mark in the gospel, in his gospel account, 
And it, it's a pair of contrasting stories. And the first of the two stories is actually one story uh, buried inside of another. You, you know the little wooden nesting dolls where you open one up and there's another identical one right inside of it? Well, the first story we're going to read is like two nesting dolls. It's one hidden right in, inside the other. We're going to begin reading in Mark uh, chapter 5, verse 21. And I'll just set it up simply by saying, at this point, Jesus, we don't know how long he's been doing public ministry, but he's been doing it for a season at least uh, to the point that word has gotten out in uh, the central part of Israel that there is this guy that had been an unheard of. Nobody had really known who he was, and he's got great authority, great power, and he's doing what nobody else can do. He's healing sickness He's driving out demons, and, and he's just got incredible authority when he teaches. And so people are coming by the thousands to hear him teach and to experience the power that is reported around him. And in verse 21, it says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, this is the lake of Gennesaret, it's the Sea of Galilee. When you're picturing this, envision kind of the, the upper third or upper half of Mobile Bay. It's, it's about that size body of water. He just crossed over again to the other side. And then one of the synagogue leaders, when they landed there, uh, named Jairus, came up. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Now, again, when we just trying to get the picture in our heads, when we say synagogue, we're basically talking Jewish expression of the local church. When we say synagogue ruler, picture the local pastor. So it's Jewish pastor of a, of a local congregation. Think what would come with that, what people would think of him, sort of what his role would be. But he's looking very different than a normal week for him. When he saw Jesus, he ran up, he fell at his feet, and he pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Can you just for a moment pause and, and feel that moment? Feel the weight of that. Sometimes these are familiar stories and we just breeze on through that. But pause and think of the weight of this. Now, as I share details that maybe you don't find in Mark's account, I'll just point out Matthew and Luke tell us the same story, and Luke gives a lot more details. So if I say things that aren't in Mark, they came from the other accounts. But here's this guy. He has one and only one daughter. She's 12 years old, and she is critically ill. Any moment could be her last moment. He's feeling the weight of no one can help her. Maybe this is the one chance that she has. He's desperate. And as he comes in... He comes running into a massive crowd. Can you imagine the challenge? All of these people are needy. They're all needing something from Jesus. Luke says that the crowd was pressing in so in, in such a frenzy around Jesus that they were almost crushed by the crowd. So you, you recognize, I mean, even just approaching this is going to be a challenge. How are you going to even get to Jesus? And if you get to Jesus, how are you going to get his attention? And how can you possibly extricate him from the crowd and get him to your house? It seems like an impossible situation, and yet he's so it's so urgent, and he is so insistent that he makes it to Jesus, he gets his attention, and Jesus agrees. And it says in verse 24, so Jesus went with him, and a, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And now the story buried within the story. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus... She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And if you've grown up in church, you've heard this story before. We've all heard this story. But again, I just want you to try and transport yourself back and, and be the woman for a moment. 12 years, it says, she has suffered. We don't know what her illness was, but it was an illness that involved a bleeding that could not be remedied. She had literally spent every penny that she had on every doctor she could find to go to, and for 12 years, it said she had only gotten sicker and sicker and sicker. You have to imagine after 12 years of going downhill, she's at a very bad place. If anybody in the crowd is hopeless, you would think she would be the hopeless soul. 12 years, never gotten any better. But something in her connects with Jesus. And she is convinced, this is finally the one who can help me. If I can just get to him. And, and there's something really touching to me about the fact that, now Jairus, 
he realized, I'm going to have to get Jesus' attention. Whatever I've got to do, I have to get his attention because I'm going to have to get him to my house. I can't get my daughter to him, so I'm going to have to bring Jesus to the house. So however much noise or whatever I've got to make, I've got to get his attention. And this woman is the opposite end of the spectrum. She desperately needs what Jesus has, but she does not want to draw attention to herself. And it just dawns on her. I bet it would be enough. I think there is something so special about him. If I could even work my way through the crowd to somehow get to the place that I could just get a hand on him. If I think if I could even touch the robe that he's wearing, I, I bet something would happen that would change my life. And she presses in, and she gets her hand there, and sure enough, in the moment that she touches Jesus' clothing, she feels something sweep over her body. And she knows in her heart, it happened. It happened. Whatever is wrong with me is finally made right. And she just draws back. And for just a moment, if you're watching a video of this, it would look like the crowd is going to pass her by. But no, in that moment, Jesus, just after another step, he stops cold where he is. Because something in him recognizes that something really important has just happened. Verse 30, at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd, and he asked, Who touched my clothes? Now, realize what a silly question this is, because countless people have been pressing in, trying to get a hand on Jesus. Luke tells us that the, the next words in verse 31 actually came from Peter, not a surprise. Peter said, You see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Somebody say hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Twelve years of suffering and Jesus says it is over your faith has made you well, and you are done. Your suffering is ended. And then he moves on. We move back to the original story. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. They come with very bad news. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? It's too late. There's no hope. Come on home. It's time to mourn your daughter and bury her. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. Now, Luke says the reason that they laughed at him, bear in mind Luke is a doctor, he said the reason they laughed is because she was actually dead. But after Jesus put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the three disciples who were with him and went in where the child was, and he took her by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. Can you just imagine? Now, I, I know sometimes we'll try and rationalize a scene like this and say, well, maybe they were just mistaken. Maybe she was just unconscious and her breathing was really shallow. Let me tell you, you don't have to make it to the 20th or 21st century to know when people are dead. They've been correctly identifying dead people for a long time in the world. When the breathing stops and the heart stops, that is dead. The skin grows cool and the color completely goes away. By the time that they could get there, this child was so clearly dead. It was absurd to, to think that anything could be done for her. And Jesus said, this is not a problem. And with just one statement, Luke says it causes the spirit of the girl to return to her body and she is raised to life. Now, we get perplexed a lot of times by Jesus' response because he did what he almost always did. He said, 
shh, don't tell anybody what I just did. It's not that he's trying to pull anything over on anyone. Word is spreading so rapidly about what he's doing that it's becoming impossible for Jesus to travel around and do what he's supposed to be doing because of the crowds. And every time there's another report of a healing or a resurrection, just massive waves of people are coming. And that's why he's saying, just don't tell anybody right now about that. Let that just be between us for the moment. Of course, nobody keeps the secret. So here we have... A miraculous healing and a resurrection from the dead, but we're not done yet. Remember, when the the writers of the scriptures are writing, they're not putting verse numbers and and chapters. They're not breaking it up this way. So, So many times we'll read and we'll stop there because it's the end of a chapter. But when Mark wrote this, he wrote he just went right into the next thing that we're about to read. And there's a reason why we need to read these side by side because He's telling these one after the other for us to see the contrast between these two stories. Verse 1 of Mark 6, Jesus left there and he went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. Now this is a big deal that Jesus is going to his home because the last time we heard from Jesus' hometown or any of his family was three chapters earlier. In Mark 3, you may recall that the family of Jesus, his mother and his brothers and sisters, came to where he was doing ministry, and it says they were, they were offended by Jesus. They were embarrassed about Jesus, and they came essentially to say, we know he's lost his mind, we know that he's nuts, and we've come here to bring him home and settle him down. Because this is crazy what's going on, and all of this stir around him, and Jesus would have no part of it. In fact, he wouldn't even go out and talk to his own family. It was a really... It, It had to be one of the most awkward moments recorded in all the Gospels. Jesus loved his family, and yet he wouldn't even go out and interact with them because they were so at odds with each other, because they were so disturbed by what Jesus was doing. And so for the first time now, Jesus is taking his disciples and going back home to the little village of Nazareth where he had lived for about 30 years. What's going to happen there? Verse 2 When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Bear in mind how many hundreds of times must Jesus have spent his Friday evenings in this same little synagogue. Everyone knew everyone in Nazareth. I mean, even today, I've been there. Nazareth isn't that big of a a town today, but in Jesus' day, it was very small. Jesus had been to synagogue his whole life in this place. For decades, he had gone to synagogue here. He had never been the teacher He was not the one that was the center of attention. And now when he comes back, Jesus is the one who's talking. He's at the center of of it all. The people were amazed, and they said, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles that he's performing? Now, so far, those sound like good questions, but what you can't hear is the tone, and there is great skepticism in the tone of the people asking, and we know this because of what follows. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Did you realize Jesus had a lot of brothers and sisters? And aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Now do you feel the tone of that moment? Who does he think he is? Who does he think he is? Going to try and act like he's somebody. We've been watching him for 30 years. He makes a decent table, but he's not going to change the world. He's just a carpenter. They're offended by him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He just makes a simple point. A true man or woman of God that the Lord is using powerfully, the world can see that, and the world will recognize that and honor that. But he said, you know, the last ones who will ever catch on to what's really going on are the people who've known you your whole life. In your own hometown, you'll be treated like a nobody. And he said, that's what's happening here. And what I really want you to notice is the verses 5 and 6. Jesus could not do any miracles there except to lay his hands on a few sick and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Now we may look at that and go, still sounds like it's a pretty amazing trip when a few people got healed. You have to bear in mind that the gospel writers tell us that in village after village after village, Jesus would go in and heal all of their sick and cast out every demon of everyone who was being tormented. 
And yet in his own hometown, it says he could not perform miracles. And he was just astounded by how little faith that he found there. These stories stand in such sharp contrast. The crowd of people, desperate, hungry, hurting, and the miraculous power of God present to meet needs and do the impossible again and again. And Jesus goes back to his hometown, anxious to meet the needs of people that he's known. I mean, can you imagine what it was like for Jesus, the Son of God, to live in a community where real things are going on? People that you really love and care about. I mean, some of you are like me. I grew up, my parents lived in the same house that I was born in for the first 49 years of my life. It was super stable. The neighbors who lived around them lived there for decades. I mean, some of them were there the whole 50 years that my parents were there. So you, you come to really know and love and care about them, and, and you feel their illnesses and you feel their losses. And I, I can just, even now, I, I remember neighbors and friends who lived in that little town and who we watched struggle with issues over a long period of time. Can you imagine all the people that Jesus knew in Nazareth that he loved that he cared about, and for 30 years, he just lived with them and watched them be sick. He just lived with them and watched this crippled person who had had a stroke and, and struggled to get around. I mean, all of the issues that must have existed in that little community, can you imagine how excited Jesus must have been that now that the Spirit had come and filled him and he was filled with power and he had been given the green light from the Father to go and do ministry, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to declare the message of the kingdom. And finally, he gets to go back to Nazareth to take care of these people that he's cared about, and he is just heartbroken to find there's no faith. And he can't do for them the things that he's doing for people all over because they won't believe. I picture that, and I wonder if he doesn't feel very much the same way about us. How at points all over the globe, he is moving powerfully, he is working miraculously, he is healing, he is restoring, he is setting free, and yet right here in the church, in churches all over America, People's bodies are sick and their minds are tormented and their relationships and marriages are, are coming apart. And he is longing to step in and bring his power to bear to heal and deliver and restore. And he can't. Because there's so much unbelief. Friends, there is a, a decision that we're going to have to make. And it is a decision that we are going to stop operating in the realm of what we can control and define and manage and what we can resolve on our own. And that we choose to step into the realm of depending on God and trusting the power of God to do what we can't do. That we get back to the basics of trusting in the power of God. Now, I want to take a step back from the story that I just shared with you to try and put in bigger perspective what I feel like I'm supposed to communicate with you today. When Jesus began his public ministry some months or maybe a year or so before what we just read, the launching point for his ministry was, of course, when he was baptized and the Spirit descended on him and he was immediately led out into the wilderness for 40 days. And that was like the final preparation and then with the announcement that John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, John the Baptist had a key part in preparing the way for Jesus. But when John was locked up, that was the starting gun for Jesus. He knew that it was time to go public because the ministry of the forerunner was finished. And now it's time for the Messiah himself to step into the, the forefront of everything. And so he does. And in Matthew 4, Jesus takes this step. And the message of Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry was the message that permeated every day of his ministry. It was a very simple message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is arriving. I find that intriguing for a lot of reasons, but for one, 
I think the church, in large part, doesn't even grasp the meaning of that. We don't even know what to do with that, and this was the message of Jesus. Virtually every page you read from that point forward in the Gospels, Jesus is always talking about one thing, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. He couldn't tell a parable that it wasn't about the kingdom of God. Trying to, to reshape our thinking, this whole message of repent, it means you've been thinking one way your whole life. You've been operating on one set of premises, and I understand that. He's saying, I, I get how you think. I totally understand it. How, how did they think, by the way? Well, they thought based on how history had been up until that point in time, and it had been pretty gloomy. It had been pretty impossible to, to see any hope because for thousands of years, for countless generations, darkness had ruled. The history of humanity had been incredibly dark and violent. Genocide, rape, systemic abuse, I mean, all kinds of horrible things had just been the norm. Reading the Old Testament is a painful experience when you read the narratives. Wouldn't you agree with that? I mean, think about it. In all of the people on all of planet Earth, the one group of people who had any hope of redemption for all of the Old Testament history were the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, because God had said, I'm going to do a work here. I'm going to let it start here. So they are the ones who are getting God's attention, but the Spirit has not come in power. So even among the Jewish people, the people where there is the most activity from God, the most attention from God, even among the Jewish people, it's so depressing. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, go back and read Genesis. Read Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. I mean, you just want to pull your hair out going, oh, my goodness, it's so depressing. They'll, they'll get a little better. They'll do a little better under a godly king, and then they'll crash and burn, and the level of wickedness will be worse than it had ever been before. And it's just amazing, this cycle. Over and over we read in Kings, and so this king did more wickedness than all those who had gone before him. But hang on, because the next one's going to come along, and he's going to top that. It's just this terrible death spiral to worse and worse and worse places and so people don't have any sense of hope or progress they only have one hope and it is the hope that one day God will send his anointed one the Messiah and that he's going to suddenly fix it all well when we finally get to the gospels we're given four huge surprises those of us who've been in church we're not surprised about much anymore more in the Bible, are we? We're, we're sort of immune to that. There isn't news in the good news for us. It's, it's old news. But if we could step back and see it anew, there really are four big surprises. And the first one is that God has actually come to earth, and he did so as a baby human. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody expected that it would look like that. The devil didn't expect it. The angels in heaven didn't expect that. No one in history had realized that God would show up and be a baby and then just live as a human. Nobody saw what that was going to look like. And then the second big surprise of the Gospels is what Jesus was announcing in Matthew 4, 17, that the kingdom of God is at hand, that the power and the kingdom have suddenly showed up on earth for thousands of years, everything in the heavenlies, everything in heaven was exactly as it should be. There is perfection. The will of God is always done. But on earth, where Satan is the prince of the power of the air, he is the prince of this world, and darkness has reigned, and it seems there is no progress, and there seems to be a huge gap between what's happening on earth and what's happening in heaven. But when Jesus came to earth, and when he went public with his ministry, it is as if he kicked open a doorway between heaven and earth, and for the first time, the kingdom of heaven is going to spill over into human history. The kingdom is about to arrive. The third great surprise of the Gospels, the unthinkable has happened. The creator of everything, the author of life, allows himself to be arrested, tortured, and murdered while the world watches. No one expected this. Even Satan himself didn't believe this was possible, that the author of life has been put to death. And then we know what the fourth great surprise is. This body that has been so butchered and mutilated that you would not want to have to look at it is raised to life. 
Jesus, after being publicly executed, is raised to life and appears publicly again and again. So from the perspective of his contemporaries, it's just everything takes your breath away. How he shows up, huge shock. That he lives in obscurity for 30 years. What's going on when he goes public? The power of God on display. <gasps> wow, nobody's ever seen anything like this. That he's put to death. Why in the world? That he's raised to life. Woohoo, great. Now he can really take charge. Now evil is going to be defeated. And he, he just ushers in his kingdom. And he sits on his throne. And he makes everything be the way that he should be. But the surprises aren't done yet. The, the final narrative of the New Testament is the book of Acts. You know, we have five narrative books in, in the New Testament, and four of them are telling the same story, the story of the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But most of, of what they write in those four gospel accounts covers a span of three and a half years, Jesus' public ministry. Acts picks up the narrative exactly where the gospels end, and it covers the next 30 years or so of this period that we're living in now, which is the church age. And everything that I've just shared with you doesn't really have full meaning and context unless you also know the two gigantic surprises of the book of Acts, and they come right on the front end. The first shock of Acts is right there in the first chapter. That Jesus, who now is resurrected and is in position to do anything that he wants to do, and what does he do after 40 days? He takes off and returns to heaven and is gone. What on earth is happening? Hasn't he come to usher in the kingdom of God? And yet he was only here for such a short time. He only did public ministry three and a half years. He only stayed here 40 days after his resurrection. And now he's gone. What a shock. And none of that would make any sense were it not for the final surprise of the book of Acts. And it happens in chapter 2. Jesus said before he ever was executed, before he was arrested, I'm going back to the Father, and it's going to be better for you that I go back to the Father because I'm going to ask him, and we will send you the Holy Spirit, and he will live in you. He will do in you what I have been doing. In fact, all of you will do what I have done and even more and so sure enough, 10 days after Jesus ascends and returns to heaven with instructions, you just stay here and wait and pray. You wait for that promised gift. Because when he comes, it's going to be the game changer. After he comes, power will be on you and in you. And you'll be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, the whole surrounding region, and to the uttermost parts of the earth because you will be filled with that power. And sure enough, 10 days later, the 120 followers of Jesus who have hung in there and they've been praying and they've been waiting and they don't know what they're waiting for. They don't know what this is going to look like. And nobody could have told them. It was another shocker. Something is happening. It's starting to get rowdy in here. It's starting to get noisy. It's a sound like a rushing wind. The walls are shaking. There's so much noise you can't hear what anyone else is saying. And now you can see it. It's like tongues of fire. And they're, they're descending on people. And one person after another, the tongues of fire come upon them. And something fills them in that moment. And they're changed. And when they walk out of that place, they have the same power that Jesus had. And they step out into the whole Pentecost experience where people by the tens of thousands have gathered from countries all around the Mediterranean. They've come to the holy city for this religious festival. And so lots of them don't speak the same language. And suddenly, because they have the Holy Spirit living in them, they can speak the languages of all these people. And they declare the works of Jesus. And in one day, 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus. Because these guys now have all the power that Jesus had. And the huge surprise of the book of Acts is that Jesus' time on earth in one physical body, which seemed like it was, being, it was going to be the crowning moment in all of human history, was actually the precursor to the crowning moment. That all the power of God dwelt in one body. We, we tend to fall into the trap of feeling like, oh, I just wish. 
How I wish I could have lived 2,000 years ago so I could have been here and seen what it was like for Jesus, God, to be here on earth, to see the miracles, to be there, to be present for the power. Friends, that's a trap to think like that because that was the precursor to the main event, which is Jesus physically went back to heaven so that he could send his spirit so that we live in the great miracle, which is the body of Christ, the physical presence of Christ. It's you, it's me, filled with the Holy Ghost so that wherever we go, we get to bring the wisdom of God, the power of God, the discernment of God for every situation so that needs can be met and the power of God released. That is beauty. That is the good news. That's why Jesus said you are going to have to repent. You're going to have to change how you think because you've, been, you've lived your whole life with such low expectations. The life is rough and things are bad and it ain't going to get any better. That was the Jewish mentality. That was human mentality 2,000 years ago because it's all there had ever been. And Jesus said you better change how you think. I've got great news for you. The kingdom of heaven, it is at hand. It is right before you. He couldn't say it has arrived yet because it hadn't arrived yet because the kingdom isn't really ushered in until that day of Pentecost when the Spirit descends on every believer and bam, now we enter into a new age where the power of God is present to do everything that Jesus could do wherever we go. Tragically, if you just pay attention to the way that Christians in the American church tend to talk and think and operate, it seems almost like we're first century Jews. That we're people from somewhere way back in history who still are just going, oh, it's so bad. It's just so bad. I wish the Savior would come and just save us from all of this. I mean, do you not hear that? The tenor of, of our conversation today, Christians in general talk as if we are living in the dreadful in-between. As if a Christian worldview is that the plan of God has these two wonderful bookends. And that is, Jesus physically comes to earth 2,000 years ago, does ministry for a little while and goes back to heaven. Oh, it was good. And then we live through the desert of all the years since. But hold on, church, just hold on, because one day Jesus is going to come back and it'll be good again. That is not a Christian worldview. Satan wants you to think like that. Satan wants you to have that picture in your mind of what our experience is. I don't care how it sounds. I'm just going to say it straight. I'm sick to death of Christians moaning and groaning. Jesus has got to be coming back. I mean, surely he's coming back this year. It's just so bad. I'm sick of people thinking like that. I'm sick of hearing Christians talk like that. I long for the day of Jesus' return. It's going to be a wonderful thing. But I want to tell you, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to be glad in the day that Jesus made. You know why? Because Jesus is here. The Spirit of Christ is here. The church age has arrived. Jesus has a body. Jesus is on earth. And we are it. That's what Paul is talking about when he de delivers the good news. Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. The church is Christ's body. It's filled with him. And he makes everything complete in every way. That's why we can fulfill what Jesus said in John 14, 12, when he said, I can assure you whoever believes in me will do the same things that I have done, and they will do even greater things than I have done because I'm going to the Father. It's this incredible picture of what life is like and what it's supposed to be like in the church age. Jesus is here. And the kingdom is advancing. We're not just trying to hold on and hope there's a few of us who are still left and faithful at the return of Jesus. No. Jesus is taking the planet. Jesus is claiming humanity. The church is marching forward. We lose sight of that in the West because we live in a period when the church in the West regionally has been in decline, but globally is going crazy. It's growing like kudzu all over the planet. We lose a sense of that in America. It's time for us to step back and reclaim our mantle as the hope of the world because we are the body of Christ. 
But part of what we have to understand is this shocking truth that in the church age, God has chosen to limit and link his power to the church in much the same way that a locomotive's power is tied to a train's tracks. I want you to think about that one for a minute. Is God's power limited in any way? Well, it's not limited by anything that anybody else puts on him, that's for sure. I mean, we can all agree God can do anything that he wants to do, right? I mean, his power is unlimited in that sense. And yet, God has chosen to limit his power in terms of how he works in the world. And this is mind-blowing for us. But he limits his power in much the same way that a locomotive limits his power to running only on the train tracks. There are few things on earth that possess the power of a locomotive engine. It can haul a load. But the strange thing about a locomotive is it can't just go anywhere. It can only go where tracks have been laid for it. Well, God could work anywhere he wants to. God could do anything that he wants to. In one sense, he is unlimited, but he chooses to place limits on himself. If you're wondering, yeah, is that true? Do I believe that? It's easy to illustrate it. Could God today, in a moment of time, with one spoken word, could he save all seven and a quarter billion people on planet Earth today? Could he do it? You better know he could. He could save everyone today. But I promise you he won't. Because he's made it clear that he has chosen to focus and limit his work and his saving power. He has a track that he is running on. And here's the thing that shocks us. The track is the work of the church. The track is tied to the church and how it acts and responds in faith. You see, people only get saved where the church takes the gospel. That's who gets saved. The, the scripture is clear about this, that the power, that, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. You don't take the gospel, they don't get born again. God could save them without us, but he doesn't. He says, I, I'm laying a track. I'm partnering with you. I don't need you. I honor you by making you a part of this. So you are going to be my body on the earth for good and for bad. You're, you're going to be it. And so your actions, your choices, and your faith will determine whether or not the power of the locomotive gets brought to bear in a situation. The stories that we just read illustrate this so clearly. Jesus shows up in two different situations there. In the first one that we read about, and they are completely open to that. And the power of the locomotive is on display, and he's able to haul the load of every need in that crowd. Jesus shows up in Nazareth, and they don't believe. And what does it say? He could not perform miracles. That's a strange thing to say about Jesus in any regard, isn't it? Did Jesus just show up feeling a little spiritually anemic that day? That's why he couldn't do anything? No. He had all the power in the world. He had all the power that God the Father possesses. But he could not perform miracles because God had chosen to limit himself. And he says, I'm only going to let my power out where there's faith present to receive that. And there's not faith here, so I can't do anything. I have limited myself. We're, we're each going to have to bring our part to bear. You're going to have to bring faith. I bring the power. And when those things meet, the miraculous happens. But God says, because I've set those parameters, when I show up with all the power of the locomotive and you come with little or no faith, there's nothing but a church meeting. There's nothing but a ritual. There is no release of power. It, it's... Wonderful and disturbing all at the same time, isn't it? I mean, the wonder of it is to realize every time we get together, the power of God is present to meet any need, to do the miraculous every time that we're together. That's the beauty and wonder of it all. But the disturbing part is if we bring no faith into the equation, he can't do anything miraculous among us. Because he's chosen to limit himself, that his power is only going to be displayed where we bring faith into the equation. And I know if you come from a background like I do, we get really nervous about talk like this. See, I grew up Baptist, and a lot of us who came up in non charismatic evangelical traditions, which I love, by the way, I'm so proud of the tradition that I came up in, but we get really squirrely about this kind of stuff. We start going, Whoa, wait a minute, preacher, wait a minute. You're making it sound like that's tied to us. 
You're making it sound like the power is coming from us. No, it's not. We aren't the source of the power. God's the source of the power. But God has made it clear that he's going to connect his power to our faith. That's why Jesus says again and again what he says to the woman. Your faith has made you well. When people say stuff like that, we're, we're notorious people who come from traditions like mine to want to go, no, 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 don't say that. That makes it sound like it was about you. It is about nothing but the power of God. So let's don't confuse this at all. Jesus, he didn't fret over it. Clearly the power of God's here because I'm here. But you got well today, lady, because you brought faith to the equation. Paul sums up this whole thing that we're talking about in Ephesians 3 rather well when he says, My task is to bring out in the open and make plain what God, who created all of this in the first place, has been doing in secret behind the scenes all along. I love, uh, in another translation, it refers in this passage to the great mystery of God, that God has been doing this stuff in secret. Angels and demons couldn't figure out the, the surprises that we just fleshed out from the Gospels and Acts. That through followers of Jesus, like yourselves, gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels, because they're so shocked by it. And all this is proceeding along lines planned all along by God and then executed in Christ Jesus. And when we trust in him, we're free to say whatever needs to be said and bold to go wherever we need to go. Don't you love that? Do you get what he's saying? This was all a secret plan. Nobody ever figured it out. No prophet, no scholar, no angel, no demon ever figured out the secret plan of God. That God would become a baby human. That he would live a sinless life. That he would usher in the kingdom of God. That he would die and be raised from the dead. And then he'd suddenly go to heaven. But he'd send the Holy Spirit and boom! Jesus is all over the place working through us. And he says, now through ordinary folks like you and me, Gathered in the church, the secret plan of God is being unveiled, and now we are bold to go where we need to go and say what we need to say because wherever we go, wherever we speak, it's like Jesus physically showed up. He is here in the flesh, and he is talking through us, and the kingdom of God is being ushered in a life at a time. Isn't that good news? But the problem, here's the problem. The problem is that people and churches often prefer or settle for man-made solutions and programs rather than depending on God's power. I want to just illustrate what I'm talking about there. Because we can look at that and say, well, who would ever do that? Who would ever prefer that? Who would ever settle for that? And I would contend pretty much every one of us. Because think about how we actually do life. Somebody gets sick. Let's use the extreme example. Somebody gets somebody gets a terrible diagnosis. It's it's cancer. It's heart disease. It's stroke. You know, it's something really debilitating, life threatening. What do we do with that? We immediately run to the doctor, get all the tests done, and then what do we get? We get the final verdict on what's going to happen. And that's how we think of it. The doctor is going to tell us the final verdict. Are we going to live? Are we going to die? How long do we have to live? It's up to the doctor to tell us. And then we base our plan on what the doctor has said. And this is it. Now, in desperation, we'll, we'll start sending out prayers to God and holding out some little hope of a miracle. But at the heart of the matter, most folks that I know the doctor's word is the final word. We get into a place of great emotional distress. We're, we're dealing with awful anxiety, terrible fear, crippling issues of depression. It, it's causing, it, causing us to hardly be able to function. It's destroying our most important relationships. And what do we do? We, we go to the therapist, and we let the therapist's word be the final word. Now, please don't misunderstand anything that I'm saying. I am a big believer in using modern medicine. It's a gift from God. All healing is from God. 
I think we're foolish if we don't utilize modern medicine. I'm a big believer in using good therapists when, when that is something that would help. But it is a trap to think that the therapist's word is the final word on this marriage or on your life. It's as if we no longer leave God anywhere in the equation. When we look at our financial situation and we get into a bind, we let the accountant or the bank or our checkbook tell us what the final word is. And I want to tell you, friends, that the doctor and the therapist and the banker are not the final say. God's word is the final word. We fall into this place where we let the natural define our lives. Instead of saying in every one of those situations, what does God say about this? Because that's the final word. Whatever God says he wants to do, that's what's going to be. We're going to just believe God for whatever he says he wants to do. And if God says, I'm going to sustain you through sickness, okay. Then I'll be sick and God will sustain me. But if God says, no, I want you to be well, then I'm going to be well regardless of what the doctor says. The bank account may say, I don't have enough money to get through. I'm going to lose the house. But if God says, no, that house is yours and you get to keep it, then God's going to make a way. God's going to provide. And I can trust him to work supernaturally to make that happen. Churches will fall in this same trap, by the way. I'm not sure churches won't fall in this trap faster than individuals do. It's safe for churches. It, I'm just being honest as somebody who's been a church leader for years. It just feels safer for churches to do things that they know they're going to succeed at. To do things they're never going to look bad, they're never going to look like a failure, and they're not going to make God look bad. So we can plan services and programs and activities that are positive, that are uplifting, and we just declare that fruitful ministry. And hopefully we'll draw a crowd and we'll be able to pay the bills and along the way a few people will get saved. And Glory to God, the church is being the church. But it's so much safer and easier to let everything revolve around programs and education, Christian education. I'm not talking about first grade, second grade, third grade. I'm just talking about a system where everything is about kids go to your classes, adults come and worship, and Tony, you do some little uplifting songs that get us to a better place so that we're ready for the main event, which is the preacher is going to get up and he's going to teach us. And we'll learn something more and we'll be better Christians because we learned something in church today. Am I the only one who feels like there is something terribly broken about that plan? Jesus did not come to institute a Christian education program. The world did not flock to Jesus because they were in need of Christian education. They came to Jesus because they were desperate, and only the supernatural power of God would meet their deepest needs. And I want to say to us, church, that the world out there will come in droves to the church when they discover that the power of God is showing up that sick people are getting well, that people who have just been overwhelmed emotionally and living in bondage, that they're getting set free, that broken people, their lives and hearts and minds and marriages are getting restored because of the power of God. You won't be able to keep people out when the church decides we're not content to do programs and music and teaching. It doesn't mean you do away with those things. It just means we won't settle for that anymore. We have a choice to make. And we choose not to be content to just do the programs. Do you see why this is so critical for us? So how do you get past that? I know I'm out of time, but give me five more minutes. I think the answer is found in the story that we started with. Three things are necessary from us if we're going to tap into God's power for healing, deliverance, salvation, restoration. The three things that we see in these stories. The first one is desperation. Desperation says, I can't fix this. Jesus is my only hope. When Jairus came running up to Jesus, is there any word that better describes that moment than just desperation? You've got to come. You are the only hope. He is on his knees. Please, you can do it. I believe it. When the woman comes to Jesus, it says she had suffered very much. Many doctors had tried to help her, and all the money she had was spent, but she wasn't improving. In fact, her sickness was getting worse. That is the picture of desperation. I'm out of money. I'm out of specialists. There is no hope. Jesus, you are the only hope. Friends, this is why the beginning point of a Christ-centered recovery program is this. No matter what your problem is, you always have to start with this. My problem's unmanageable. 
I can't fix it. I have to tap into a power that is beyond me. Only the power of God could take my broken, messed up life and make it any better. You, there is no help for you until you get to that place. It takes desperation. So as long as we think that trying harder or taking a pill or a class or reading a book is going to fix it, then knock yourself out because there's no power for, for that situation. Because God has determined this locomotive is going to run on a track, and it is the track that we're laying out right here. It is the church responding in desperation and faith. It starts with desperation. And by the way, Isaiah and I, <clears throat> we talk frequently, and one of the things that we talk about from time to time is how in Africa, <clears throat> in the African church, the things we're talking about today are commonplace. I mean, like every conversation we have, we talked Tuesday at great length. And once again, he said, oh, the number of miracles is beautiful to watch. Every Sunday to see people being healed and to hear the stories of the people who have been healed that week. And I know in the American church, we can tend to hear that and go, God, what is your deal? You just like Africans better than us? I mean, what is up? No, he doesn't like Africans better than he likes Americans. The same principles are in play for Africa that are in play for us. And Isaiah and I, we, we talk about it all along. Part of what's different for Africans is they don't have the safety net that we have. They don't get sick and go, well, what specialist are you going to go to? Have you tried Dr. So-and-so? Have you tried the such-and-such -such program? Have you been to Mayo yet? They don't have that. He's like, our people, they only know one thing to do, and that is they come to the church and they cry out to God and they trust God to work a miracle. And we see miracle after miracle after miracle. We see people being set free. We don't have any other hope but Jesus. Desperation is the starting point. The second thing is faith. Faith that says, I believe that Jesus will answer me and meet my need. Not just that he could, but that he will. Notice the response of both of these people. Jairus says, my little daughter is dying. Please come and lay your hands on her. Then she will be healed and will live. The woman thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And in response, Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you well and your suffering is over. Somewhere in this, and, and I get it, some of this is a gift from God and some of this is a, is a response from us, but somewhere in this, we are going to have to be willing to muster the courage, the boldness to start praying and declaring things in faith. It is more than just always saying, well, Lord, if it be your will, and maybe you could, maybe if I throw up enough prayers, you might answer one up. No, it is it is the belief that when I pray, it is like Jesus is talking about this. It is like Jesus asking the Father for this. And God, as I pray for this, I do believe you're going to act. And the final piece is patience. This is, I will wait and believe as long as necessary for Jesus to come through. This is the part that throws us. It's the part that's gotten a lot of us off track. Because we asked in faith and it didn't happen quickly. Somebody that we love has been sick and they didn't get well quickly. Somebody that we love has been in bondage or they've, they've had an addiction or some issue and we prayed and they didn't just suddenly get set free. Don't lose sight of the fact this woman suffered for 12 years before she ever got healed. We don't know how long this little girl was sick, but we know this. She stayed sick to the point that it looked like it was beyond help. She had to die before there was ever a demonstration of the power of God in her life. This is the really hard part is that we can't say how it's going to play out. We don't hold a stopwatch on God. And there are going to be times where it doesn't play out the way that we thought it would, and it doesn't happen the, the way that we prayed that it would, and that still can't stop us from continuing to pray and believe God for the other situations that are going to require the power of God. I'll never forget many years ago having friends that were husband and wife, strong believers, and it was the strangest thing, but they both in the same year were diagnosed with terrible forms of cancer. Not that there are any nice forms of cancer, but I mean, both of these were, were terrible cancer diagnoses. Very grim. The husband first. Did not look good for him. And as he went back for a follow-up visit to get the report of all the tests, and he's going to get the final verdict. Everybody knows, you know, that visit. You're going to find out if you're going to live or die or how long you've got to live. So he's going in for that. And a friend who was praying for him, spoke to him in faith and said, you're fixing to go get the report of the doctor, but you believe the report of the Lord. Hear the report of the doctor, but believe the report of the Lord. So he went in and he heard the bad news from the doctor, but he just held on to that. 
believe the report of the Lord. Believe the report of the Lord. And the Lord had really impressed on this friend and on him that God wanted to heal him, wanted to raise him up. And so he, he did what he had been told to do, and he began his course of treatments. And the Lord completely healed him, completely restored him. In spite of the grim report from the doctor, completely restored his health. But while that's taking place, his wife was diagnosed with an awful form of cancer. I don't remember the name of it, but it was in the cranial area behind one of her eyes. And when she went in for the report from the doctor, it was, it was so grim that they said, well, we're going to attempt first to do surgery to do what we can, but you're going to lose an eye. We'll have to take out an eye to be able to even get to it. You'll lose that eye, and then these are the chances that you'll have if, if you do all the treatment. And I'll never forget when the husband called me today, that, the day of that report to say, all right, well, here's what the doctor said. And as he's talking, the Lord spoke to me. And I, if you know me well, you know I don't run around just flippantly saying that about stuff. But the Lord really spoke to me while he was talking. And he spoke from John 11. And he said, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God that this has happened. And so I just, I said, man, I need to just stop you and tell you. I feel the weight of what you're saying and all, all that you must be feeling. But I want to tell you, God just spoke over your wife right now. And he said, this sickness will not end in death, that this was for his glory that this has happened. He's fixing to work a miracle in her life, and I'm not just mustering that up. God just declared it over her. And he received that in faith, and the Lord did. I mean, the Lord miraculously removed the cancer from her body. Now, in those two situations, he did it in different ways. One of them, the husband, had to go through the, you know, the misery of months of dealing with the illness and the treatments, and the wife got miraculously healed. They both emerged healthy, and here more than 15 years later, they are cancer-free and walking in, in good health. But God did it two very different ways, but in both instances it revolved around the same thing. The doctor said one thing, the Lord said something else. We have choices to make. We can choose to operate in the natural in terms of what we can define and explain and control and take a pill for or pay for. We can operate in the realm of we hear what the doctor and the therapist and everybody else has to say, but we choose to believe what God says and trust in the power of God to meet the need. Which one will we operate in? Some of us need to just come to a place of saying, God, help me to reach a place of desperation. Plant in me a gift of faith so that I stop operating in the natural because I want to be a man or a woman of real faith. Some of you have already been at the place of desperation. It's just been hard to believe God because it's been a while. I want to invite you today to just ask God to birth faith in a new way in your heart as we turn to him together in prayer right now. Would you pray with me? Oh, Jesus, you are good and your plan is right and your power is without end. And we give you praise today. We worship you. Lord, I pray today for people who come with very real needs. There are some who are listening today. They need your power to come through. So I'm going to ask you to do some very specific things. God, I pray that you would speak into their hearts right now at a level that only you could get to. That you would speak to them what you want to do. That you would birth faith in them by giving them just a glimpse in their imagination of what you want to do. Of wholeness, of restoration, of freedom. God, Give a glimpse right now of what you want to do and a gift of faith to believe you for that. Friends, would you just be willing, maybe you hadn't done it in a long time, would you just be willing to pray in boldness and in faith and ask God to do the impossible in that situation that's come to mind in your life? Maybe it's something in your own heart, maybe it's in a family member. Would you just pray because of what Jesus has done and because with his death, his stripes have brought healing into our lives, would you pray for that? Lord, we ask you today, pour out your power to heal. Pour out your power to save and to restore. And we pray today, oh God, for a gift of faith to be poured into our, church, into our, our hearts and into our church. That faith, This church, the Freedom Church, would be a church that is full of faith and boldness. 
Thank you for your calling on our lives. We worship you today. We welcome your work among us, and we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful, and above everything, I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward uh, some type of spiritual decision, maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind, I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.